Welcome to the HBC Walkworthy Podcast. It's a joy to be here with Pastor Kevin and Sandy Hannaford today. Um, she is taking the seat of Sergey Lee, Pastor Sergey Lee, who, um, well, I guess he didn't, but Kelsey had their baby yesterday at 7.59 a.m., so we're so thrilled for them, and uh, please be praying for them in the coming days as they probably sleep less but have a little baby to cuddle with. As we uh, look to get into this podcast, um, we are going to review the sermon from yesterday that we're we're recording this on Monday, and the sermon was in Galatians 4, uh, verses 1 to 7. Uh, Great verses, man, just so much packed into those verses. Actually, let me just read them before we get into it, and then I've got a little bit of a reflection to read uh, from a book that accompanies me on my desk as I prepare sermons. Uh, The text from Galatians 4 says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, the God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son." And if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. This uh, text, as I was preparing it, um, I uh, sometimes I jump into a book called Meditations on Preaching by Francis Grimke, just to remind myself what the task of preaching is all about, and to really focus myself as I'm reading and rereading the text and reading other books about the text. And this week, I really I I love the the meditation. on preaching that was presented in this book. Let me just read it for us. It says, The prayer immediately preceding the sermon should be such as to create an atmosphere favorable to the reception of the truth that is to be presented in the sermon. It ought to be a kind of forerunner preparing the way for what is to follow. Such a prayer will have much to do with the kind of impression the sermon will make. This is a point that is well worth thinking about in our pulpit ministrations. There are usually so many distracting thoughts that are passing through the minds of the worshipers that if the prayer before the sermon, that in the prayer before the sermon, we can quiet those thoughts, can allay them, can hold them in check and center the mind upon spiritual things. And if we can do that, it will greatly help to a favorable consideration of the contents of the sermon. The soil in this way can be prepared for the reception of the truth and very often is. The prayer before the sermon very often comes as the voice of the master in the midst of the noise and confusion of the storm saying, peace be still. And so the calm comes and the inner quiet where people can listen without being distracted. Just really appreciated that. Sometimes it's easy to fall into a, well, you know, the, the, the prayer before the sermon, that's just what we do. We pray before we open God's word. And and all of us together as worshipers can fall into that. Yep, that's this is just almost ritualism. This is what we do. That was just a helpful reminder to me. And so, I took a special uh, note of that and, uh, you know, in the in the prayer before the sermon, was just trying to open our hearts up before the Lord as we got into His Word. With that, Kevin, and or any comment on that, Kevin? I just want to say, <clears throat> the main reason I'm praying before a sermon is because I'm I'm going to be expounding on the Word of God, mm-hmm. and I want the Spirit's help. Mm-hmm. And so it's a, it's a personal prayer for me. And hearing him say we're also praying for our, our listeners in that moment. And usually we're praying for our listeners in the pre-service meeting and, mm-hmm. and in preparation for the sermon. And, I, and to, to think in terms of we're also praying for our listeners in that prayer right before we begin to, to preach is... That's important too. Very important, yeah. And there's just distractions that we bring in, and there's you know we we we, we've sinned during the week, and maybe we're processing that for the first time, you know, on a Sunday morning. Maybe we've just been busy. Maybe it's taken forever to get the kids dressed and down to their classrooms, whatever it is. 
you know, it's it's helpful to have that calm and quiet before the word is preached. Anything in particular that um, the Lord did in your own heart as you listen to the sermon from this past week, something that stuck out to you about the truth of the text? I loved the way, first of all, I want to comment on your prayer that the thing that stood out for me was that we don't want to just be hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. Yes. And that, for whatever reason, stuck out for me. And I appreciate all the time that you put into preparing for your message. Um, the thing that stood out, of course, is the comparing and contrast contrast mm. of the two, um, not only uh, birth mm. in human life, but birth as a spiritual being, hmm. and then contrasting that with um, death, which is really the result of um, sin and hmm. being under the bondage of sin, and the life that we have that's, to me, incomprehensible, that why me? Why did God choose me to be an heir of the mm. King of Kings. Yeah. Just that, that comparison. And of course, as you mentioned, the marvel and automatic response of praise for what he's done mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, praise the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> for me, uh, on a personal note, when you made the comment, worldliness equals slavery. Yes. That really struck me, because how often do I lapse into worldliness? Lapse into worldliness before I get to church, there are things I'm distracted by and concern me, and I don't respond well. And then after church, on the way home, there are things, and that realizing that that worldliness is beckoning me back into slavery, it's, it's seeking to re-enslave me. Mm -hmm. You know, the devil is an enemy that would that would enslave us and kill us if he could. It's only the power of God in Christ that prevents that from continuing in our lives. And so for me, just a, re a reminder of that, because it harkens me back to Exodus, when you see the people of Israel, after they've crossed through the Red Sea, saying, have you just brought us out here to die? I mean, back in Egypt, right, we had leeks and onions and pots of meat and was that was so great and we and we read that and we think how foolish are you and yet that's exactly who we are when we entertain worldliness in our own hearts and in our own lives we are hearkening back and almost reminiscing fondly over our slavery to sin and i find myself doing that all the time and th that picture of worldliness equals slavery paints a vivid picture for me that helps me fight that fight spiritually. Yeah, that was a that was sort of like a turning point in my own sanctification um, a number of years ago when I realized that these passions that I have for the things of the world are not just neutral desires that, you know, like I've got an affinity for this or an affinity for that, but these are actually things that have you know, snapped a chain on me, and they are yanking me around in any direction they see fit. My heart is going after them. My heart loves these things. And it's not my heart that is in control of these desires and pleasures and passions. They are in control of my heart, right? They dictate where I go and what I love. And there's this almost descent that takes place in your life. The more these things take over, the more you descend into just greater and greater bouts of slavery. Yeah, I think, you know, John Calvin said that our hearts are idol factories or desire factories. And our hearts are deceptive because we invent these desires in our hearts. We think we control them. We think we master them rather than we are spewing out the very things that master us. Yeah, I had written down that particular worldliness equals slavery, and it really rang true for me, especially in the world at large, not just 
the things that I'm craving, but the people who influence me in um, desiring and placing value in these things. And then I think of the value of Christ. Mm -hmm. And it just, but I struggle with that too. I think we all do, where we're constantly battling um, the humanness and our self um, with all that we have in Christ, which is hard to yeah. believe that we would do that, That's but right. it's just our human nature, isn't it? That Prone we... to wander. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it's amazing, you know, that, that whole contrast that you mentioned earlier, Sandy, it was sort of the picture I was really trying to paint in the opening illustration of rags to riches, right? These people who go from, you know, J.K. Rowling accepting welfare to being worth a billion dollars. And and then I was as I was thinking about that, I was going, man, we all want that to be true of us, don't we? We all want a rags to riches story, you know, when it comes to wealth, when it comes to the transformation of maybe relationships that we have or or whatever it is. There's a whole host of things where we we desire change from this impoverished state that we're in to a, a state of thriving and riches. And what's amazing about the gospel is that you just you can't get better than this, <laughs> <Exactly>. right? <laughs> From slavery to sin, where it was this worldly master, right? To to freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I mean the the text just so wonderfully. I mean the turning point in verse 4 as it as it gets you into so this is where this is where you used to live, but now that the triune God has worked Here's what you exist in. I mean, it's just it's it's absolutely incredible. That's what made me marvel this week. Yeah, and I you know I I hadn't thought of that phrase in verse four, but when the fullness of time had come, in relation to the metaphor that Paul is using of the date set by his father, and oh yeah, the father sets the date when the heir comes into his own with receiving all things and is no longer under guardians and managers with the full in the fullness of time the the date and time set by God for Christ to come and we become heirs by faith in Christ An- another piece that I noted in in your is you were referring to rags to riches and you had mentioned the prosperity gospel and how the prosperity gospel sells the gospel short because it's referring to the wrong kinds of rags and the wrong kinds of riches there are those who are impoverished in our world who are, um, the way Hebrew speaks of them, people of whom the world is not worthy. Right. And they are wealthy beyond imagination because they are in Christ. And the idea that we're just talking about financial or situational rags moving to fabulous wealth is selling the gospel short. We are spiritually impoverished, first and foremost, and then spiritually enriched in Christ. The friendship of God, the familial inclusion in God's family, that's true riches. Mm -hmm. And the prosperity gospel not only sells that short, but then leaves people disillusioned when it's not working out the way they expected. That's right. That's right. Yeah, go ahead. I find my struggle is not wanting discomfort as, as much as, you know, wealth. I, I just want my life to be perfectly smooth, mm-hmm. no discomfort. But God tells us in this world, you will have struggles. Yeah, you'll have trouble. Yeah, you will have trouble. Mm. So it's, it's, you know, wrestling with that. But I'm so grateful that through the Spirit, as I release that, the peace that I receive is so much better than what I think I I really want. So, and I think that's I think that's why a guy like John Newton, who we we look at now and we go, oh, he wrote Amazing Grace and he wrote countless letters. He had such wise counsel for all those around him. He's such a figurehead of Christianity in so many ways. That's why he needed to put up above his mantle that verse from Deuteronomy, which we talked about at the end of the sermon, reminding him, I have been freed from slavery and I have been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he knew that, you know, we we get into these situations of suffering where we go, I'm I'm disoriented. I don't, 
you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't know what, which way is up and which way is down, and I need this verse to reorient me, right? This contrast has taken place. I want comfort, right? I loved that verse. <laughs> yeah. Oh, isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. So that was, uh, I, I, I feel like, you know, all of us need to have those reminders in place in our lives, whatever form they look, so that we remember that this contrast is true of us and just the glory of what God has done. I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about that, putting those contrasts before us, because your your one application is to marvel, and you were talking about how you marveled this week, and your and we see the the triune God, each person of the Trinity at work in this. You know, we marvel at the work of the Father, we marvel at the work of the work of the Son, and we marvel at the work of the Spirit. But I, what I had wished that you had drill down upon, and this is this is what I wish every week, mm. is how, how do we cultivate marveling in our life? What mm. are the practical ways? John Newton put a verse up on the wall to remind him mm-hmm. so he would marvel. Mm-hmm. But he, you wouldn't just say to John Newton, marvel at this. He said, okay, how am I going to do that? I'm going to take this verse out of Deuteronomy and I am going to tack it up on my wall so I see it every day, yeah. so I do not forget to marvel at this truth. And I think that kind of practical help, how do we marvel? Let's just ruminate on that for a moment. Yeah, that's right. So uh, Practical wh- ways to marvel. What are, what are ways that you set reminders in your life? So, a couple of ways that, that I do that, and, and really I... It's not lost on me, the cleverness of you throwing that question back at me. I, I see what you're doing there. <laughs> I can start if you want me to. No, no, no. Yeah. I'm just, no. That, that, that's kind, but you've already, you've already turned the, the table, so. Uh, okay, stop the recording. No, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So one of, the, one of the ways that I do that is to sit down with my wife in the morning, and we don't do it all the time. Like, I'm a big fan of getting through uh, year-long devotionals in two years. That's kind of our schedule. Nice. You know, we're not doing it all the time, and yep. sometimes it takes three years. Yep. So we're not doing it perfectly, but we're aiming to sit down every morning and take a bite of scripture, something, and a devotional thought to help set our minds mm-hmm. on on scripture, and that helps us marvel uh, throughout the day. We've got something that we're beginning with mm-hmm. that can help us marvel. Another way that we're doing that is we're we're pra- we're practicing this. Um, we're engaged in this practice, which is ostensibly to help reset our circadian rhythms, so we have a little more energy during the day, and we're sleeping a little bit better at night. It's a it, it's just a, an exposure to sunlight in the morning, and there's a rhyme and reason to it. And you can ask my wife if you want details. But one of the things that I try and do, and I'm not always successful, because sometimes what I'm dwelling on is I'm just sitting outside at sunrise. That's all I can get out of my head. I could be in bed right now, but I'm sitting outside at sunrise. But there are other times when I am I am marveling at the creation of God, which is designed to speak to me of his glory, and marveling at sun, sunrise, marveling at beauty. Mm-hmm. Because I think oftentimes we think of theology as everything that's in the head, and we have these I, debates about ideas, and and but theology is also the stuff of beauty and the stuff of grandeur. That because that's the kind of thing that we're talking about when we're talking about marveling. Mm-hmm. We're marveling at something that just uh, takes our senses for a ride, and so that's another way is just engaging with God's creation to marvel at our God and to in, to see beauty in his word and beauty in his creation. That's another way I marvel. And then I marvel at God when I find myself not marveling. When I catch myself not marveling and I say what a gracious God that we have mm-hmm. to keep pouring out grace on me such an uh, such an ungrateful forgetful creature. Mm-hmm. And I marvel at that. So, and and my wife helps me marvel. She catches me sometimes in those moments, right? Where mm-hmm. the slightest inconvenience, if I can f- point the cause at somebody else, man, I get irate, right? Even just 
talking about the way home from church, uh, somebody at the roundabout just waited a little bit too long and lost their opportunity, which slowed us all up. And I was that I was irate mm-hmm. because I was impatient in that mm-hmm. moment. And what have I done? I've where's in my Leanna asked me, well, where where's God in your world right now? Mm. He's nowhere. Mm-hmm. In that moment, I have stopped marveling at the graciousness and the supremacy of God and his sovereign work in my life, even in that moment of inconvenience, and I've lost it all hmm. in that moment. And uh, catching me at that is like, okay, I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to process that, and God still is for me, and he still loves me, and, he's, and in some way, he's for the person who was in the vehicle that hesitated and and I have to be completely reoriented, and I marvel at that, that our God is patient with us, even when I'm impatient with others. Hmm. No, that's really helpful. I have a verse that I've taped to the inside cover of the Bible that I have at home, which just reminds me about the privilege of being the Lord's. Uh, Jesus says to the disciples in Luke, uh, do not rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And that helps me. There's a story actually associated with that. Ian Murray comes and <clears throat> sits at the bedside of Martin Lloyd-Jones in his later years. And Lloyd-Jones can only get up for a couple hours a day and type out, you know, the next manuscript for, from a sermon that he used to, uh, that he preached back when he was healthier. And he's putting together all of his sermons into books, but he can only do it for a couple hours a day. And then he's got to get back in bed because he was just an older man, uh, a sickly man in his latter years. And I think Ian Murray asks him the question, um, how, do, how do you feel? You've been reduced to this from being, you know, in one of the greatest pulpits in, in the UK. And Lloyd-Jones just thought for a second, and he quoted that very verse. Don't rejoice that the, the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. I find that a very orienting verse. And so that's just a helpful reminder to me in my life. Like that's what counts. Yeah. As, and and really it's very future yeah. looking. Yeah. Right. And it, it, it kind of helps bring the, the grace of the future yeah. in the consummation to the here and now. Yeah. That's right. No matter what happens, we can be thankful that our names are written in the book of life. And that should reorient us in everything, whether it's a traffic situation or a hold up somewhere else or or some bad news coming along or something not quite going the way we'd hoped mm-hmm. or a bad terrible dire diagnosis of of illness you know it's not that we're well it's not that we're wealthy it, it it's not that things are all going our way that matter it's that our names are written in the book of life because none of those other things are promised right that's right exactly i any- find i marvel in my daily devotions because I had a bad habit of going straight to commentaries, and I've since been praying that the Spirit would reveal to me what He wants me to know and how He wants me to respond, and starting to make notes, okay, you know, do this, don't do that, (laughs) that kind of thing, and I, I can't help marveling when the Spirit reveals things to me, and occasionally now I will go and look at, Absolutely. at a commentary, and the same message that that commentary got, I got. Hmm. But I do marvel at creation. There's no question. I, For me, being in creation, um, the beauty of nature... Um, also, the beauty of, of a new baby, mm-hmm. um, all of these things, I marvel at that. Yeah, no, I always, you know, I say to Brianna all the time in our rental, we've got like sort of wraparound windows and we've got the best view on the block because there's just trees um, across the street from us and there's ha- the other views are just houses, houses, houses. And anytime it rains or anytime the wind is blowing, you see the tree swaying. And I go, oh, it is such a ministry to be sitting on this side of the table, looking out this window at these trees. Isn't the Lord, you know, as a torrential rainfall comes down, isn't he powerful yes. and good to water the earth? 
So, I mean, countless times over the last year and a bit, we've just marveled at the Lord through our windows. <laughs> yeah, and I think, and I think too, it, th- what you're saying too, Sandy, <clears throat> how we even approach Scripture, how we read Scripture, can either be, you know, we, we struggle, I think, to engage with Scripture in ways that it doesn't become just a rote ritual where we're checking the box and saying, I've done my due diligence today, now I can move on. Or, or trying to gain some sort of spiritual merit because we read Scripture today. Because you can read Galatians 4 like that. And to think about how do we avoid that. And one of the ways I, I, I try and avoid that is to say, God is telling me something about who He is in Scripture and something about who I am in relation to Him in Scripture. And that's the stuff of marveling. When, when God has revealed who He is to us, that's... That's the fodder for marvel, for marveling. And when you, even when you look at what God is revealing of himself in Ephesians 4, 1 through 7, he is the God who has come and set a date to release us from the slavery of sin. To he, He's the God who rescues. He's the God who, who adopts. He's the God who makes us heirs of all of his glory and goodness in Christ, that is worth marveling at. Yeah. That's who he is, and then who are we? We are, the, we are the former slaves who are now children of God and heirs of his riches. And we can marvel at that, not just check a box saying, well, I read my, my devotion for the day, mm-hmm. but look who God is for me. Look yeah. who he's telling me he is and, and who I am in him. I also love to marvel at children and um, marveling with them uh, about, you know, for example, at camp this past week, we were, you know, saying, what is it like in heaven? And what are you looking forward to? And their enthusiasm becomes my enthusiasm and vice versa. So... No, that that childlike faith. Yes. it's, It's nice to return to that. And go, oh, life isn't full of all of these complexities like I think that it is sometimes. Sometimes a child can speak through the mess and just hit the profound point on the head. Absolutely. Oh, praise the Lord. You know, when when the text turns to verse 4, when the fullness of time had come, this sort of this long-anticipated time, God sent forth his son, and there's all these little phrases, right? And I tried to unpack each one. And each of them could, you know, deserves a full sermon in one sense. You know, when God God sent forth his son, well, we could talk about what the Bible has to say about God sending his son and the mercy of that, the beauty of that, the grace of that, the plan of that before the foundations of the world. The humility of that. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I tried to be very um, concise, as concise as I possibly could be on each of them. There's a lot of them. Um, Was that helpful? Um, Were those clear? Uh, Any feedback on that in particular? I liked that it was concise. Mm. I didn't go off, but I can go down rabbit holes, so (laughs) what can I say? Me too, Sandy. (laughs) Anytime Caleb is concise, it's a good thing. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) So it was helpful to me. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, good. Praise the Lord. Uh, Yeah, I, I... I think no, that's that's the, good. The concise, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> the conciseness of it helps you pack more of a picture in a smaller place. Exactly. Right. Yep. To, it, it feels more concentrated, mm-hmm. and we're seeing more at once, mm-hmm. and that's helpful. That's right. Uh, I even think in verse seven, uh, the you you actually referred to the conclusion earlier in your sermon, yeah. and then, uh, but verse seven. I, I see the already and not yet in mm-hmm. this verse. So you are no longer a slave, right? That's the already. Slavery is already over. Mm-hmm. We are already children of God. We are we are sons of God, but we are also heirs through God. Mm-hmm. And heirs speaks of inheritance, yes. which is future oriented. That's right. Right. So we're no longer slaves. We are sons, but the inheritance is yet to come in its fullness. Yeah. And so, but we have something now mm-hmm. that, and what we have coming in the future is reflective of what we already have. Mm-hmm. So, let's not forget about the already as we long for the not yet. Yeah, yeah. And I find that hard to do sometimes. Yeah. 
you know, as I went through this section, I was amazed at that whole, the whole reality of adoption in Christ. I, I've done a lot of thinking on it and reading on it in, in past months and years, but as I was confronted with it again this past week, I was going, this is truly amazing. And there were like eight different thoughts that I had about, you know, anyways, we, the sermon could have gone on 15, 20, 25 minutes longer just on that one point there, because it is, it is absolutely, truly amazing. And so I think, you know, when I referenced J.I. Packer and his three-word summary of the New Testament, adoption through propitiation, and then I said, okay, is that really the theme of the New Testament? And then you start to look at Paul's letters. 10 out of 13 reference God as our Father right off the beginning, right off the start. That can only be true of those who are in Jesus. You, Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, our Father who art in heaven. So you start to think about that reality, and the New Testament is really trying to drive home. You're not just in a, you know, you know, Jesus likes me relationship, and the Father, he can tolerate me right? No, no, no. You are in the closest possible relationship to the Father. Because you're in the Son, you actually relate to the Father as the Son does, because you are in Him. It, I mean, it's it's just, it's it's breathtaking. I loved the comparison you made, too, about a father run, you know, the son running into his father, and then I had looked up at a father, and it's like, Daddy, Yes. So it's it and it just spoke to my heart when you talked about the family relationship because that's you know that's what we have to compare it to. That's right. On this world. Yep. And it's so much more intimate and even reverential than any of those than any of the comparisons that we could ever make. Yes. But but it's the closest that we can get to to um, describing what it is like to be in Jesus and have God as our Father. Yes. Oh, so, yeah, it's an amazing reality. It, it, it makes me think another song we could have sung together on Sunday is, You're a Good, Good Father, right? Because that's... Right. I don't know, do we... I don't know if that one gets... We sing that very much I, in Hespler. I, I don't think I'm familiar with it. That yeah. yeah, yeah. And just this idea that he is a good father because he, he has... He has set guardians and managers. He has given us the law to expose us. He has, in the fullness of time, mm-hmm. uh, per- sent Christ. He is adopting. He has adopted and is adopting people for his own family. And he is has an inheritance for each one of us. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a good father. Yeah, amen. Anything unhelpful, unclear? Or uh, any any critique of any sort that you could make of the sermon that will help me to grow? Would love to hear it. So, as he's talking about the law, we, we've talked about the law in a few different ways leading up to this sermon, mm-hmm. and now it's being spoken of as a guardian and a manager, and you mentioned uh, royal regents, and... To, to talk a little bit about in what way is the law, we talk about how the law exposes us, yep. uh, that righteousness is not attained by the law. In what way is the law a guardian and a manager right. for us? And that, that we didn't dwell too much on no. that facet of the law. That's right. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Because the law is not... We talk about the law and we say, well, it exposes our sin, it shows us God's holiness, it shows us our need for a Savior, and we think primarily as we say those things, negative, right? The law, bad. But the law is actually a grace. It's a help, right? It is a guardian. It is a manager, right? Scripture speaks about it with with some of these positive terms, until Christ comes, right? There is something better. If we look at the law alone as the only thing that's going to save us and make us right with the Lord and the thing that we have to obey in perfection, man, are we ever defeated and the law is definitely a negative thing. But as the law does its work and points us in the direction that it was designed to point us to, there is something positive to say about the law. So the law is a positive guardian and manager in that the purpose of the law is to point us to Christ. And that, and you've, you've alluded to this, well, you've done more than allude to it in past sermons, but how Christ fulfills the law is not merely his perfect, 
positive obedience of the law, which is what you mentioned on Sunday, but also he is everything that the law was pointing to. And you got into that a little bit when you mentioned uh, how, oh, we need, a, we need a better mediator, we need a better prophet, we need a better priest, we need a better king. That's kind of what you're aiming at, that the entire narrative of the Old Testament and its laws and its precepts and its wisdom and its poetry mm. and its prophecy, its histories are all pointing us to Christ and, and gearing us up for the coming Savior in the fullness of time. Yeah. And that's how it's a guardian and manager for us. Mm-hmm. For me, com- the, the word guardian uh, immediately brought to mind parents, and there are things we, we have to safeguard our children from, and immediately I thought, you know, like even punishment, and there are things that we do that are good in parenting if we're safeguarding our kids. And so I think the use of that word helped me to draw that um, goodness from the law. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's for our benefit sometimes there are rules, you know? Right, right. Yeah, for our benefit that the law is pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ and guarding us in that way. Yes. Yeah. Anything else on the, uh, the sermon from the two of you that you want to say? I, the last thing I want to point out is, because I, I just heard a commentary on, on this a little bit in a, in a podcast by a man who grew up in a Christian home and um, believed himself to be a, a Christian, but has, has later left the faith, and how it was impressed upon him the very sense in which he needed to remember he was a sinner. He needed to remember that he was a, he had been a slave, uh, because oh, yeah, of course there's Jesus, which is good, but you essentially have to have this posture being down on yourself all the time, huh. and you really uh, you you address that at the conclusion of your sermon. It really could use some more time spent on it, but that that remembering. Our past slavery is not meant to lead us to despair, but to cause us to marvel at how it points to the freedom that we have in Christ, right? It's, it's the black backdrop upon which the diamond shines, and it's the diamond that is to draw our attention. And that our, our condition is not the focal point. It's just the backdrop, I think, for the glory of God and what he's doing for us and in us and, and on our behalf. And yeah, so that we are not meant to be a despairing, um, disparage, self-disparaging people, mm-hmm. but we're be a, a people who are rejoicing in what we have become in Christ yeah. and what more there is to come. Which is why it's so helpful to recite and know and dwell on those things which are true of us. I am forgiven. I am reconciled. I am regenerate. I am a child of God. I am redeemed by the Son. Right? There's just so much that Scripture gives us by way of uh, titles for who we are. So, as we we wrap up, uh, anything that we should be looking forward to in the the next couple weeks to come? Yes. One of our associate pastors with a beard is actually the only one with a beard, Kevin Dow is actually going to be uh, teaching on love. The attribute of love. Yes, God's love this coming Sunday evening. And I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, Anything else I'm missing here? I'm I'm trying to think. Uh, I think you're going to be preaching next week, but Pastor Sean is actually going to be wrapping up his sabbatical. Yeah, that's right. He's back back on Monday, week today. Yeah. Yeah. So pray for Sean and Meredith. Yeah, as they as they return, uh, and then of course we're rejoicing again with Sergey and Kelsey Lee at the birth of their new son. And is there anything else that we should be I'm thinking, thinking of? I'm thinking of the HBC camp that's traveling to Quebec. Yes, and hoping that that will be a wonderful time of ministry and blessing both ways. Amen. They travel. They they start their travels this Friday. Yes. So be praying for them. All right. Thank you very much. That was 
was fantastic. Thank you.